Thanks, Axel. And uh, my favorite thing is to talk about liquid biopsies, actually. More than immunotherapy these days, but uh, liquid biopsies, I think, ha have a lot of potential down the road. Uh, it's still early days. And what do I mean when I talk about liquid biopsies? Well, liquid biopsies are any tumor-derived elements or markers that are released into the circulation. And it's emitted into the circulation, and it can be circling tumor cells, microRNAs, DNA fragments, um, exosomes, there's a variety of different things. I'm going to focus on circling tumor DNA during this talk. Next slide, please. So this is what I was referring to when I talk about circling tumor or liquid biopsies. Fragments or elements that are released from tumors into the circulation either by secretion through apoptosis or necrosis. And the result is a sloughing off of either cells, cell fragments, fragments of DNA, fragments of RNA, microRNAs, and that soup enters the peritumoral fluid and then enters the circulation. And that can be captured. And capturing that can give us information that is valuable and in my perspective can potentially change how we manage patients down the road. And the origin really is primarily of circulating tumor DNA from apoptotic cells or cells undergoing necrosis. And if they undergo necrosis, large sheets of DNA enter the circulation. If they undergo the traditional apoptosis cascade, then an organized number or size of fragments enter the circulation. And circulating tumor DNA has the advantage of being incredibly specific. The way we identify circulating tumor DNA is by mutations. And mutations are only present in the tumor or pretumoral tissue and not present in the corresponding normal to that patient. But to detect that, we need technology that's ultra-sensitive. And that technology allows us not only to detect these rare fragments in the circulation, but also allows us to distinguish mutant DNA from non-mutant DNA in a very specific manner. And specificity is very important. If you can imagine PSA and all the trouble we get in with that because of its lack of specificity. PET scans are not very specific. We get into trouble with those. Uh, CEA in our hands it can be nonspecific, as can CA199. This is emitted from the tumor and is mutated, and that's how you identify it in a very specific way. It's almost like an HIV viral load. That's not going to be a false positive in most cases. And the two ways that we can determine whether or not there's circulating tumor DNA in the circulation is by a technique called digital PCR, which allows you to look at one mutation at a time, typically a point mutation, or by next generation sequencing, which allows us to look at large regions of DNA and look at things like rearrangements, copy number changes, point mutations, and deletions. And I'm just going to dive right into what I think are probably the two premier applications of this technology. And the first one's minimal residual disease. And what is minimal residual disease? Well, I went to what normally pops up first on the internet, which is Wikipedia. And minimal residual disease isn't new. It's a concept that has been around for a while. And individuals that are treating patients with liquid tumors know that minimal residual disease is a very important concept for the management of these patients. Um, but it's when a small number of leukemic cells or cancer cells remain in the patient during or after treatment and the patient's either in remission or not. And the question in solid tumors is, can we find the same sort of paradigm where a patient with a tumor undergoes definitive therapy that's potentially curative, and there is a test for minimal residual disease, and either you have minimal residual disease or not cured or not cured. Now, that would be ideal. It would allow us to decide who should get adjuvant therapy or not. It would allow us to say who needs intensification of adjuvant therapy. And it's my perspective that many of our targeted adjuvant therapy studies, which should succeed in biomarker selected populations, are failing because this population is diluting any signal we're seeing in that population. And this type of approach may allow us to see signals much better in that population. The example I give here is stage two and three colon cancer, where the majority are cured by surgery and a small fraction are not cured by surgery. Is there a way to distinguish these? 
And in liquid tumors, we have many examples of molecular biomarkers looking at molecular remission and seeing if we can determine whether there is residual disease after definitive therapy. And these are just some of them for the leukemias, um, a variety of either specific rearrangements in the immunoglobulin T cell receptors that you can detect after treatment, specific genes, and the most classic one is a BCR able rearrangement. And in lymphomas, again, you have a variety of markers, commonplace in the treatment of these patients. So why hasn't anything like this taken hold in the solid tumor arena? Well, there are a few requirements. It needs to influence clinical decision making, and the standard of care of adjuvant therapy is there for breast and colon cancer, but really not in a lot of other cancers. We, we're struggling to find the benefit of adjuvant therapy or the right schema of adjuvant therapy in many solid tumors, so the, the demand hasn't been there. But I think we're in a situation now where not defining these subgroups is actually hurting our ability to treat patients effectively in the adjuvant setting. And there are other systemic approaches looking at minimal residual disease, imaging, protein biomarkers, CTCs, and circulating nucleic acids, which I'll talk about. Many of these are not sensitive or not sufficiently specific to make clinical decision making. And this is where the circulating tumor DNA actually data really began when we thought that this was an application that we could use. This is a mouse. We measured the circulating tumor DNA. And when we cut the tumor out, the circulating tumor DNA went to zero. And using this concept, circulating tumor DNA has a very short half-life. So when you remove the tumor, the DNA in the circulation is going to disappear in a few hours. So you could have a positive circulating tumor DNA and a negative one after surgery. And so our first experiments doing this in humans were using an approach called digital PCR, where we took tumor tissue, sequenced it for the well-known mutations, and then probed the plasma after surgery or throughout the course of this patient's treatment and saw what the circulating tumor DNA looked like. And this is an example. This is a patient with a mutation in APC, a colon cancer patient. And this is before surgery. And you can see here in this quadrant, this is the mutant fragments. And this quadrant here in the green are the wild type fragments, the non-mutated fragments. And before surgery, there's an abundant amount of circulating tumor DNA in the circulation. This is a two mil blood draw uh, that we got this data from. One day after surgery, it's almost all gone. But I want you to remember something. It's not completely gone. Day 42 comes to see the medical oncologist, and the CT scan is completely negative. CEA is normal, but we see a slight increase in the circulating tumor DNA. And by day 244, the CT scan is eventually positive. There's evidence of recurrence, and we see a much greater increase in circulating tumor DNA. So in essence, we could detect minimal residual disease even one day after surgery. So how has this progressed? Well, the original study did initially that. We took out tumor tissue, sequenced the tumor tissue, and probed the plasma after surgery. And we looked at a handful of patients, a couple dozen patients, post-curative resection for metastatic and localized colon cancer, and measured initially CEA after surgery, six to eight weeks after surgery, when we have to make the decision about adjuvant therapy. CEA positivity was much worse than CEA negativity. But that's not clinically actionable. You see a slight difference there, and that's statistically significant, but I don't care what curve you're on, you're not going to be happy on that chart. But when we looked at circling tumor DNA, the ones that were positive all recurred, and this patient here actually recurred, but the ones that were negative, no circling tumor DNA remaining after surgery were disease-free. And obviously this was very exciting, and we're following up on that work now. And we're collaborating with Gene T and Peter Gibbs in Australia. Uh, this work actually will be presented at ASCO this year. But we looked at a situation where adjuvant therapy and the decision to use adjuvant therapy isn't clear in stage two colon cancer. So we took stage two colon cancers, resected them, sequenced the tumor tissue, and then looked at the most common mutations, and then at four to 10 weeks, probed that plasma for circulating tumor DNA with the eventual hope of identifying those patients with residual disease versus those that were not and leaving the ones alone and not giving the adjuvant therapy to the ones that don't have disease and eventually giving the ones that are positive adjuvant therapy. And this is the data so far. Um, the hazard ratio is pretty impressive. The positive ones, albeit not that many, um, all recurred except this one. And the negative ones largely did not recur. So setting up the situation where just maybe 
like our colleagues in, in hematologic malignancies, we may have a minimal residual disease marker for solid tumors. And this has been followed up in other tumor types, too. My colleague, Victor Vekulescu, just published this. And we looked in pancreatic cancer. Not as good as stage 2 colon cancer, but we still see that same trend. A, the positivity was much worse than negativity. Uh, there was a recent paper published in breast cancer, resectable stage 1 and 2 breast cancers, where circulating tumor DNA positivity was almost ubiquitous with recurrence, whereas negativity, your risk of recurrence was much lower. And this just doesn't apply to patients undergoing surgery. This is enlarged B-cell lymphoma, again looking at circulating tumor DNA after definitive therapy. And here we see the patients who become circulating tumor DNA negative. So they're positive, they're treated with definitive therapy, two cycles in, you draw the blood, circulating tumor DNA disappears. Much better prognosis than those that are negative. And I like to show this example because it's in a disease that is uh, fairly tough to treat, which is uh, lung cancer that's EGFR mutant. And these patients with EGFR mutant lung cancer are given erlotin-based therapy. And same sort of thing. If you remain circulating tumor DNA positive after three cycles of therapy, you do much worse with a median survival of 18 months, whereas those that become negative, not just objective response, but become negative to, with circulating tumor DNA, have a prolonged survival. And then finally, the concept of pseudoprogression to immunotherapy. Oftentimes when we treat with immunotherapy, we see inflammation that we think may be recurrence or progression, um, when in fact it's inflammation. Um, we've actually looked at this in a melanoma patient where we tracked circulating tumor DNA throughout the treatment, and it did not correspond to the growth on the CT scan, suggesting that it was pseudoprogression and not truly progression of disease. So, I think that the, the stage is set for using this as a marker for minimal residual disease. The key really is to get to an actionable point of no-go or go with adjuvant chemotherapy or intensification. Um, I think the timing is key. Monitoring isn't enough. We need something that will tell us a few weeks after surgery whether or not we have residual disease in that patient or not. And we need, we need techniques that are sufficiently sensitive to influence treatment decisions as well as specific. And obviously, we need large clinical trials to prove this. The other application, which is now receiving a lot of attention, is early detection. And I'll start with this. Um, we've done studies in early detection many years ago in colon cancer, but this was something that really raised a lot of eyebrows. These were women who were undergoing non-invasive prenatal testing with a blood draw, looking for circulating fetal DNA for aneuploidies. And these women were otherwise healthy women who were pregnant. The blood was drawn, but the degree of aneuploidy wasn't consistent with a fetal aneuploidy. And the levels were lower than what you saw in a fetal aneuploidy. And when they went back and looked at these patients, these were 40,000 women that were done, they found a number of early and late stage malignancies, unsuspecting in these women, so incidental finding. So that, that is one reason that I think that circulating tumor DNA now is getting a lot of attention for early detection. When we looked at 684 tumor types across different stages, what we found was when we looked, knew the mutation ahead of time, probed the plasma, and looked at the various stages, that in the stage one, which all you know are curable in about 95 percent of the cases, we could detect about 40 percent of those tumors. Now, we want to try to get that higher, and there's a variety of different approaches we're using. Um, but as the stage goes up, the sensitivity improves, and it, I think there is promise in this. If you had a biomarker that was almost perfectly specific and could detect 45 percent of all cancers, I think there's a lot of interest there. And I think that was further supported by the data I showed you in the non-invasive prenatal testing um, where that was incidentally found. So what are the challenges of circulating tumor DNA? There's many. There's many challenges ahead of us. First of all, not all mutations are cancer. As we age, we all accumulate mutations. Our bone marrow accumulates mutations in very specific ways. Uh, nevi that many of us have, moles, have NRAS and KRAS mutations. Those are clonal growths that are not malignancies, may become malignancies, that have the potential to become neoplasms. So that's that's something that is a barrier that we have to get through. 
The other issue is heterogeneity. Not all tumors secrete the same amount of circulating tumor DNA. Fortunately, colon cancers and bladder cancers and gastroesophageal cancers have a large amount of circulating tumor DNA in the circulation, but brain cancers and thyroid cancers do not. So there's a lot of heterogeneity, and even within the same tumor type, there can be heterogeneity. And also localization. Brain metastases or primary brain tumors aren't well detected. If you have a tumor that's very mucinous, the cell-free DNA can't get out. If you have a tumor that's low burden or a tumor that has a low proliferative rate, it's also challenging to get out. And then finally, in using the circulating nucleic acid tests, these liquid biopsy tests, for other applications besides what I presented, I think one of the big challenges of any sequencing effort are the lack of therapeutic targets. And this is something I've shown quite a bit. I think there's about 96 genes that are clinically actionable. About 12 of them are associated with FDA approved therapies. The remainder are either classification genes or triage you to clinical trial. So even if you could do a liquid biopsy approach to genotype your patient, oftentimes, and I'm sure people who've done foundation medicine testing or garden testing or, or caris or other testing, often don't find anything that's actionable. So even if you had a great liquid biopsy test, that's not going to improve. So I think we have to think of clinical applications that are very robust and that will really move the needle on survival and the management of our patients. And the final one, for many issues with liquid biopsies is the cost doesn't match the clinical benefit. And we're seeing that with tissue sequencing, and the same goes with liquid biopsy testing. The cost can be expensive for these assays, so we have to be very careful going forward. So the future of circulating tumor DNA assays, I think there'll be incremental improvements in the technology, but I think we're there in a couple of applications, one of them being minimal residual disease and the other being early detection to move forward with larger clinical trials. I think that there has to be a biologic-based discovery to improve the sensitivity. Uh, we don't know why the levels are so low, uh, but we're beginning to understand that step by step. One of the ways that we've tried to increase the cell-free DNA in the circulation is actually put cancer patients on treadmills, thinking that increased circulation will result in more cell-free DNA. Um, actually, we found the opposite happened. Levels went down. Um, so I don't have to bother the cardiology fellows who are doing that study with me anymore. But it was, um, it, it, there's a lot of surprises here, but increasing the amount of cell-free DNA in the circulation for improved sensitivity is a key factor. Clinical applications. I did not go over tumor genotyping, but all it is is a replacement for tissue sequencing by drawing blood. And I talked briefly about some of the pitfalls there. Um, concordance studies are ongoing, and the concordance is pretty good. It's not perfect, though. It's not the exact same thing that you find in the tissue. I'd say concordance is anywhere between 70 and 80 percent for most assays. And really, the high-impact applications will have to be ones that drive improvements in OS or PFS, things like minimal residual disease, early detection. That's where I think that the, the real um, home runs will be using this technology. So I'm going to stop there, but I uh, want to thank Swim Across America and our collaborators. And that's all. Thank you.